initiative is working on is um, helping to improve the systems for your, you and your family. And when you came in this morning, everybody should have received a packet. And they're a packet of some documents, um, depending upon who you are. But these documents are draft documents. Or if you're a preschool teacher or an early interventionist, if you're going to use an FM system or assisted listening in a device, and then on the back is also another um, tips to help your child prepare for, or for you to prepare for your child's IFSP. These are draft documents, and they have been created, and we would love it if you guys would take some time to read through these, edit these, add to these. As Nancy spoke, it's up to us, all of us, and we would like your help helping other families as well. And for every um, document that you read, review, edit, add your comments, tell us what you think, um, we would enter your name into a drawing for a $25 gift card. And tomorrow morning, um, there will be a basket on the, um, the table just outside the door. And if you want to return any documents that you've looked through with your comments and feedback, then your name will get entered into that information. But we want you to know that these are draft documents and that they are something that uh, can help other families, other service providers in the future. So we would appreciate all your feedback. So now, without further ado, I'm going to pass this over to Stephanie Olson. And this is our Deaf and Hard of Hearing adult panel. I do want to tell you, show everybody uh, something real quick. We have these three individuals, Angie Bellamy, Joe Otterholt, and Gabrielle Ryman. They are coming on as our deaf and hard of hearing adult role models so that we can connect you and your families with a deaf and hard of hearing adult if you would like to have that opportunity to answer questions and to visit with. Here you go, Stephanie, thank you. Okay, thank you. Getting close to the end of the day here. So the title of this panel is uh, could have, but it's really like could have, would have, should have, because I think there's so many times in our lives that we look back and we wish we would have known this, we wish we could have done this, we wish, you know, we should have said this. And so today we're going to tap into that experience from a panelist, and then of course if you have questions, so that um, Wendy, I do want like a uh, 10, 15 minute warning or um, announcement so that we can start questions from the uh, participants as well. Okay. So with the uh, first uh, slide, thank you, if you could, Introduce yourself, tell a little bit of background about um, your hearing, and a little bit about how you grew up with your family, and uh, what you're doing in your life. And then this is so important, what you like to do for fun. And it is so, so very important, because you grow up and it's like, oh, Stephanie Olsen got part of hearing, and she got this and this and that. And then, kind of like I said this morning, there's this whole other part of me, it's like, well, wait, wait, and da, 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 I do these other things. So we want to know, you know, more about your life beyond just your hearing. So, um, you guys, I don't know if somebody wants to go first or if we'll go in order. I'll share my microphone and then, like, that, that half of the table can do that one. But, um, anybody? I love is 
what I thought the images felt like. Um, and I still have images for very long time because of that. But um, I used a bone conductive hearing aid, um, which is not, which has been replaced by Baja now. And so the bone conductive is the um, headband one, so it vibrates from one side into the other. And so that's how I was able to hear with the vibrations onto my eardrum on my left side. My work and career. Um, so I'm right now working on my degree for psychology and I'm also at an ASL on top of that. So then I can write ASL and be able to help other students who need ASL. Um, for work, I am current, I do a lot of things. <laughs> I have a big job. <laughs> Um, it's all fun. Um, I have a little pet sitting business here in Casper. I take care of two children full time. Um, I'm their nanny, and then my third one is a uh, food delivery service. And what do I do for fun? Um, I love art, I love creativity, I love to sing and dance. Uh, I'm currently relearning how to play the guitar because I learned in middle school and then for some reason I felt like I'm time to pick that up again. I think Joe's talking for going in order. <laughs> on the ear, it would cut, it would break and cut your ear. 
him on the inside. So we both have scar tissue on the insides of our ears. The one thing about that though, as we were growing, you change animals, they would change it to the other ear. So they were switching from ear to ear as we grew up, which was a fortunate thing because it kept the auditory nerve stimulated and working. Uh, moving on, so now you know I have it as far as family goes. I have a twin brother. I have an older brother that was three years older. My father came from a family of 15 children, of which he was the fourth child and the oldest son. I bring up my father because he was the, the guy that I never knew how tall he was because he was always kneeling down in front of us to talk to us. He, he did that with his siblings because with so many siblings around, in order to get the attention of the one you were talking to, you got face to face. So that was just a natural thing for him to be face to face with a young child. He talked to us that way. Mom, on the other hand, was always busy. But if she was running the sewing machine, she would pull the rocking chair up close and set up holes in the rocking chair. And then she would run the machine and we'd be going on a trip somewhere. And she'd be talking about where we were going, grocery store. She'd She'd invent these stories. So our parents, the whole time we were growing up, were always face to face with us. My mother, when she was cooking, would put us both up on the kitchen counter at the end, face to face, while she was cooking and talking about the ingredients and that sort of thing. This probably for back then, when they had no special education, if you found a teacher of the deaf, they were only asked, hired by the school for the deaf. Why did we not go to a school for the deaf? It was my parents' decision that our, our uh, as babies when we were newborns, our health was so fragile that they, and it took them so long that they went through this, keeping us both alive, that they could not bear it and that go in and go off to a school for the deaf and be gone. So they chose to keep us at home and put us in the public school right there and for ourselves in public school, this meant we had just got no hearing aids on. We were five years old. We were just diagnosed. And two weeks prior to that, new hearing aids arrived, put them on. We're in first grade. Well, we're learning to listen. You know, we've never heard all these sounds before. As kids, the school environment, the teacher talking. Lo and behold, we go home from school, have supper, and our parents would bring out books we have seen at school all day and they would reteach us our lessons of what we should have learned that day. Mom with one twin, dad with the other twin, then they would switch off. So we had this mix of male female voices. We had this learning our lessons all over again and this went on for three years that they did this imposed, you know, we're going to teach you your lessons now every night. So we learned how to listen in school, but we went home to learn our lessons from our parents. Our parents were our only speech therapists. Uh, prior to this, of course, we had never heard speech, and now we're learning these hearing aids and what little bit we could hear, especially of the vowel sounds and such. And our parents being in that cro uh, close proximity, we were very strong lip readers, and we still are. Uh, I warned you about that because if you're in a car across from me at the intersection and you're talking, I might see what you're talking about. <laughs> and I can verify that because I had told my kids one time, oh, those people are going to the same place we are. And they're like, how do you know? I said, well, I'll go follow them and see if that's where they go. And of course, that's where they went. So then they believed also, yeah, they couldn't have read into a different car. I can have read through your mirrors. Oh, they're singing this song. I like that one. I'm going to turn my radio station until I find it. <laughs> so we were very strong oral lip readers. And then with our parents, we became, you know, we used our voices and such. My twin never did learn sign language. I learned sign language about 40 years ago after my, both of my young daughters were born and such. So I've used sign language for quite a while. Um, my twin, uh, I'm trying to substitute time for the substitute people. So anyway, I can tell you stories upon stories because I am the oldster here and I have more stories than these poor kids. I've got three times as many stories as they have. <laughs> <laughs>
right? <laughs> yep. Anyway, so uh, we are both married. We both have spouses. Uh, we both have cochlear implants now. He got his first cochlear implant because he had lost all his hearing overnight in one ear, and then a few months afterwards, all his hearing in the other ear. So then he came with a cochlear implant. I also then, much later on, about 12 years later, I lost my hearing overnight in one year, just completely gone. But I knew that to get to an ENT, you could get, be put on strong steroids and get your hearing back again. My recovered hearing was never as stable as what it was previously. It was always fluctuating, even every day, every hour. It was just the one time I used to hear, oh, this is funny, like, oh, could you turn that up? And I got worried that it was going to happen in the other ear. So that's what kind of prompted me finally to go ahead and get my implants done. Um, no? That's how fun it is. Okay, thank you. <laughs> you think that. Okay, so <laughs> let me see. My worker career. I worked at, uh, for Wyoming. Uh, I have always worked in child care settings, I should say. But after I moved to... Casper, I worked at the Wyoming School for the Deaf, and then that program turned into the Outreach Program for the Deaf in Wyoming. And I worked with the Department of Education nearly 30 years, and also worked for the Shawnee County School District, and also Park County School District, and well, it goes on. So, <laughs> and now, what do I do for fun? Okay, I mentioned earlier, my fun stuff generally is strings and sticks. Yes, I do knit. My other fun hobby that I really enjoy is fly fishing and uh, <laughs> rolling, you know, boat fishing, that sort of thing too, or shore fishing, just anything. Just to, and mostly those can be solitary type things that I kind of, that's for myself. My other thing is I do enjoy visiting with family members, so I'm always circulating around family, planning family get togethers and that sort of thing, so I enjoy doing that. Thank you, Jill. So my name is my name my full name is Gabrielle Ryman, but I go by Gabby. When I was seven and a half months old, I was identified with a moderate to severe hearing loss in both ears, and my mom actually had suspected earlier that I had a hearing loss, but everyone was telling her, "Oh, it's fine. You have such a happy baby. She's fine," you know. Her mom's like, okay, but her cries sound the same. So I must be a bad parent. I can't tell if she's hungry or tired or she needs her diaper changed. So I was aided bilaterally with hearing aids at eight months old, which I then wore until I had a progression in my hearing loss when I was in elementary school and it became severe profound. Well, it my left ear has always been better, so it was like a moderate to severe on my left still. My right ear became severe and profound, so we ended up looking into getting a cochlear implant, which I did get when I was 10 years old in elementary school. And learning how to hear with a cochlear implant at that age was very challenging for me, and I did do half days for quite some time before I finally kind of built up the stamina and learned to put meaning to the sound that I was hearing with the cochlear implant. And so, now I actually did get recently implanted in my left ear with a new cochlear, with a cochlear implant for that. So now I'm a bilateral implant user, and I'm still going through that rehabilitation process of learning how to hear with the cochlear implants, and not only learning how to hear individually with that left ear, which I've not been able to discriminate speech in for quite some time, but to use both of them together. So it's been an adjustment having sound on both sides. Like, I'm not used to hearing people like Joe and Angie talk on the side. Like, it's something that's new for me. But I've been very fortunate throughout my school career and my life to be surrounded by people who have been very understanding about my hearing loss and have just been willing to help me. Like, my family has always put an emphasis on looking at me when they speak. And when I was little, I used to, like, reach out and grab their face and turn it to look at me, and they didn't stop looking at me. But 
but I, so you've all heard from my mom today, and if you go to the barbecue tonight, you're gonna meet my dad, who's supposed to be cooking the food for us tonight, <laughs> and then I also have a younger sister, who is two years younger than me, and then I have a younger brother, who's four years younger than me, and he just graduated from high school this year. And I went to the University of Wyoming to study animal and veterinary sciences because I wanted to be a vet. That was the whole point. My whole goal when I went to school, and that plan has now since changed. I did graduate with my bachelor's in animal and veterinary sciences, but now I'm just taking some time to explore and figure out my next option. I think you need to throw in you what well, you got a four-year scholarship too to you now. Yeah, <laughs> I did. I actually got, got, I am a trustee scholar at the University of Wyoming, which meant that all four years of my schooling was paid for. So that was something that I didn't have to worry about. My only job at school was keeping my GPA up so I can keep that scholarship, which that has been a huge blessing and has allowed me to kind of explore. <laughs> Thank you. That has allowed me to explore like other options and college. It just led to this possible career change because I started tutoring my sophomore year of college and absolutely love working with people one-on-one -on -one and helping them achieve their goals and kind of like getting to know them too because a lot of the tutoring I do is one-on-one -on -one for a semester, but I have had some students for several years now. So I have gotten to know them really well and have seen them grow and improve and hopefully finally reach their goal. Because some classes can be really challenging for kids. So I'm registered for a CMA class that starts this month. And after that, I'm just gonna try and work in healthcare a little bit, see if I enjoy, if I can handle working in healthcare, and then figure out what's next from there. And as for what I like to do for fun, I really enjoy reading and other artistic stuff. I really like to draw and then paint. I'm trying to get back into watercolors because I used to do that a lot in high school and then college kind of took over all my time. All right, I'll pass it. Uh, Gabby, did you ever get your painting back from the governor's residence? I did actually. So <laughs> senior year of high school, I was did an art competition and my painting, which was a gift for a friend, was selected to go be in the governor's mansion for a year, which that was supposed to be my friend's graduation gift. So she did not get that for a whole year. <laughs> Perhaps a little bit longer because then I wanted to find a good frame for it. But yeah, I did get the painting back, Jill. And it's hanging up in her new apartment now. Hi, so my name's Addie. I'm from Cheyenne. Um, a little bit about me, I've been in Cheyenne for about 10 years now, unfortunately. I need to get out of here. So <laughs> next week I'm heading out to Utah and finding an apartment to um, just um, live on my own for a bit. And um, I'm, I have an interview next week and I'm excited to get out there and meet some new people. And I will be um, doing online classes from Cheyenne, OCC Community College. And um, right now, I'm pursuing psychology. And I say right now, because you never know. <laughs> um, so a little background on my hearing. Um, when I was little, when I was born, I had meningitis. Um, my story, I've spent a while since I thought about my story, so. <laughs> um, and my parents didn't really find out until I was around two years old. Um, and the doctors, when I was born, they didn't think I was going to make it because I was so sick, but I made it through and um, in the process, I lost my hearing. So my parents didn't find out until I was about two years old, so I missed quite a bit of time in my developing process and doctors were like, she's not going to be normal, you know, and I'm going to have problems. And um, But then my parents, we were living in California at the time, so there was a school called CHAT. It was for deaf kids, little kids with um, hard of hearing. So I was um, I was fortunate to go there and um, be with little kids who also had hearing loss and lots of teachers who supported and helped me in the process of getting back on where I need 
needed to be with my speech and um, development. So I think I'm pretty normal so far, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> um, so growing up, I grew up in California for a few years. I don't remember most of it, but I had a lot of opportunities because I still kept in, chat, uh, in touch with chat. So I met a lot of kids who were around my age and who also had hearing loss. Um, so it was really nice to be around those kids. And I grew up oral, so I spoke. I never, I learned a little bit of sign language as a kid. My family took a class together, but I don't remember most of it. Um, and now we are here in Wyoming and I have two younger brothers. They are both very handsome, I'll say that. Puberty did well for them. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, my dad, he's um, working as an IT for TJ Maxx, so he's pretty good at what he does. And my mom is speech therapist, and she does that because of me. She knew that's what she wanted to do when she saw a speech therapist being with me. So, um, and for working career, um, right now, for school, I am, as I said, I'm going to OCC, so I'll be in Utah doing that. And for work, I used to work at a dress store back in Cheyenne, just a small business, but now that I'm leaving, I will have to find a new job. Um, and then for fun, I, back in high school, I did a lot of track and tennis, so I like to be active and do lots of sports and kick guys' butts, so, because I'm definitely really good at that. I, I don't like to say guys don't, they, they just look down on girls sometimes, so it's annoying, so I show them that's not true. <laughs> so, um, and I really enjoy reading and spending time with my family before I head on out, so. I'll try to keep mine short so we can get to questions because that's my favorite part. But uh, I'm Alec Bollinger. I was born and raised in Burlington, Wyoming. So, and then uh, let's see. I, don't know. I think the rest of it covers more about myself, so we'll go to that. A uh, little background on my hearing. I was born with hemifacial microsomia, which in summary means the right side of my face was underdeveloped and in consequence uh, I have no hearing on this right side. Uh, for hearing aids I use a Baja which was explained earlier as a phone anchor that uses sound vibration to uh, reduce sound to my cochlear on this side. Um, then growing up family members. I have two older brothers, one older sister, and then uh, two younger sisters. Uh, we grew up on a farm, so we, my dad and his brother's farm, so lots of fun stories with that. But as far as I work and career, at the moment I'm attending BYU in Provo. Uh, I'm Going into mechanical engineering, I got into the program this last uh, spring. And then looking at going into biomedical engineering uh, through that. I'm taking a two-year break right now to go serve a two-year two church mission down in Mexico City. So that's my current plans. And then what I do for fun is anything outdoors. So uh, I did a lot of hiking and camping. And then uh, most of it is just having fun around the farm. But that's all I have for now. I forgot to say one thing. Um, so I got my cochlear about two years ago, December 27th of 2019. And that happened to be the day that the doctor was performing. He was just trying to break a record for how many. Yeah, so he was trying to break the record of how many surgeries he could um, do for cochlear implants. So um, I'm there, and when I met Joe, and we were sitting at a table in Arizona for the academic bowl, 
we were just talking about um, our cochlear implants, and I was just like, so yeah, I just got mine recently, a couple of years ago, like a year ago, and she's like, oh yeah, me too, I got this recently, and, and then she's like, oh yeah, mine's like December, and I'm like, me too! Oh, okay, we're, we got on the same day, the same doctor performing the surgery, so we're cochlear twins, I guess, so, with a bunch of other people, but yeah, so that, I just thought that was really funny to share, so. about, oh, this part of your story, this part of your story, and then your, you know, your story. And I think that's a good reminder to all of us is that while you have these five people on the panel, that every story and every journey is different. And um, I feel like a lot of times parents are really, you know, struggling, or maybe not struggling, curious, but they're curious and looking ahead to see what their child's life might look like. We can certainly offer little tips and supports and tricks and um, keywords, but you know we have to always keep in mind that your path for your child is going to be completely different, just like all five of these stories are completely different and fascinating, really interesting. I did see, I did see you do push-ups out there, and I was jealous. I was trying to stay awake. It's been a long day. Okay. I was very envious. I looked over and was like, oh my gosh, I wish I could do that. So but, um, the next thing that we would like to know about is um, what, what we know now, looking back, the best advice or support that someone gave you, um, that's something that, that they said or did, and it could be in school or work, or life, home, what would you something that had an impact on you? Um, yes, we'll start on this end. Um, I gave myself a lot of thought yesterday. Um, I would say the best advice or support I got was from my parents. Um, I think the most important they, thing they did for me was any time I wanted to go try new things or participate at school, um, I don't think I was ever told growing up that there wasn't something I couldn't do. And that included, uh, I don't know, they always set high expectations that if I wanted to be the top of my class, I could get there. And that mindset really carried me throughout life. Um, there's a lot of times I forgot I had a disability whatsoever. Um, one quick story on that, I guess, for an example is uh, with only being able to hear on one side, uh, being able to tell where sounds come from is really hard. And I had a teacher, we had an alarm go off in the back of the labs. And the teacher asked me to go locate where the sound was coming from, which I immediately got up to go look where it was yeah. coming from. And I got to the back and realized I had no idea. And I pointed that out to him and he started well, laughing and went back there himself to find it. But, uh, basically, the moral of that story, though, is to focus on what you can do and to have the mindset that the disabilities you have don't have to hold you back, I guess. So, um, so most of my support came from my parents, and they were really um, accepting and very good about um, making sure that I got what I needed. And my brothers, they're great. When I say what, they're like, okay, there we go. I'll repeat what I said for the fifth time. They're okay with that, you know, and they got used to that. And um, my dad has always loved on me, and my mom too. My, my mom, obviously, as I said before, she's each therapist, so she loves me for because of her job choice. and. Um, best advice I could give you for your kids is make sure they get all the opportunities they can. Especially with meeting other kids, because I don't remember most of that when I was growing up, because I went to chat. Um, I don't remember that, but I do remember the fun of it and going on the 
academic bowl team, I really enjoyed that, meeting other kids, even though if they were all signing, I had no idea how to sign. It was still really cool to go see and um, experience that for myself to see the other side, because in Wyoming, we don't have as many opportunities as other states have been given. So um, just giving them all the opportunities that they can have. And um, I have some other advice, but you know my brain's going blank, so. Well, that's it. I'll remember, I'll tell you. That this one's working. Okay, so, like, the best support I've had really has come from my own family, and especially my mom. Like, my mom has been a fantastic advocate for me and has such taught me how to advocate advocate for myself. So I, my style of advocacy is kind of modeled after what she showed me. But I also have found that I have a great support system and my friends because they've always been willing to listen and just understand like, hey, I need the captions on or I can't hear you in the car when the radio's on. You know, so like they, they'll listen to the radio in the car when I get in the car for them to take me somewhere. They always turn that down so I can hear them when we're together in the car. But it's really like something that my teacher the deaf did when I was in high school that I really still appreciate now is she sat down with me, I think it was junior and senior year, and said, okay, you're getting ready to graduate and go on to college and whatnot, and services change when you reach that point in your life and things transitioning. So we made what she called was a transition binder, and in it included a copy of an old IEP, a copy of my current audiogram, pages of resources from around the state, such as the current information for DVR at that time, you know, what steps you would need to go through if I chose to go to college or a trade school to get in contact with disability support services and whatnot. I just really appreciate her taking the time to sit down with me and create this binder because it gave me an idea of the expectations for after I graduate, for when I go to college and when I get a job, because she also had strategies for interviewing as a deaf or hard of hearing applicant for jobs, which was really helpful. And I mean, I still use that binder. I've been referencing it a lot recently because I need some of the strategies and some of the information contained within it, although now it's my important information binder rather than transition binder. I think what I had to focus on is what did that we have in my family. I think our real, see there you go with the hour, there's twins. Our real thing is, was that we were readers. Our Both of our parents were readers and they just sat down often and with each of us, one of us, um, sometimes both of us together, but generally one would have one and the other one would have the other. Or my oldest brother could also read at a young age. And so he would also take one of us and read with us. But there was a lot of reading done, a lot of pointing at pictures, naming things in the books and that sort of thing. And we, we are still very avid readers. We get most of our information comes from reading. And the smartphones now, there is all your stuff in writing. You know, you can read some more. So uh, reading, early reading and continued reading was our biggest
know when you're supposed to go, when you're supposed to pass the ball, or whatever you need to do. Figure it out, you know? Um, what was the best thing someone said for me and stuff, or did? Um, I think one of the best things for me, I mean, there's so many things that people have done that have helped me. Um, but I think one of the best things for me would be one of my past um, employers. She had, I had just gotten out of a really interesting workplace that was, interesting workplace. And um, so when I went to this new workplace, um, I knew some of the stigma and I, went, and I was just prepared for it. And, but my supervisor called me in after a few months and she's like, hey, I want to make you a manager. And I said, really? Now, granted, I'm in food service at the time, so it gets really noisy and we're, we cater a lot. So it gets really noisy and busy and that, for me, it's really hard for to know what to, who's saying what, like, whoa, what? <laughs> but I, uh, so um, she said, yeah, because you work hard, you know what you're doing, and we'll figure out what we need to do, fill in the little gaps. And I like sighed in her office because especially after the workplace that I've been through. And um, so I think that was my favorite thing was just her knowing the potential I had. And she knew I had a hearing loss. I had mentioned that in my interview and she didn't care. And uh, she's still one of the, um, people that I really look up to and like we still keep in touch and all of these things, so. Oh, that's good. Okay, give me the next slide and we're going to take a look at what would you do differently. This was a uh, playground when I was out for a run and if you can see the slide where the playground comes out of the horse's behind. <laughs> And I think that they could have done that differently. Uh, just as a surprise, but it's one of my favorite all-time photos for like, how can we do something differently? So we only have a little bit of time left so that they can ask questions. But in that, all you have to answer unless you want to. But is there one thing that you would have done differently so far in this journey? Start. I think they could have put the slide over the neck or something, you know that head probably. Um, one thing I wish I had done differently in my life was throughout elementary, well, uh, junior high and elementary school, I was very um, to myself. I was not very outgoing. I did not talk to a lot of people. I didn't talk to my teachers very much. I, I asked them for help. I would always tell them my situation. But I was never not one to have a, like, a relationship with my teacher where I could just be like, oh, how's your day going? I just talk to them about school. And I think it was mostly because I was a little insecure about myself because I was still learning about who I was. And um, so then after high school, I just, and COVID and everything, it was just like, I'm, I just changed differently. So I feel like I'm more confident so having confidence um, is a really important thing and being taught about advocacy. Um, throughout my years, I remember my speech therapist and my parents, they would always be like, make sure you advocate for yourself, make sure you advocate for yourself. And just always having that confidence, um, I definitely wish I had some of that confidence back in high school, but yeah.
want to go first? Oh, no. Okay. So I guess one thing I personally would do differently for myself is just that I wish when I was younger, and I mean, I still am a little bit this way now, but when I was younger, I was really hesitant to try new things because I was worried, oh, well, what if it won't work because, you know, my implants won't work or, you know, I can't wear it because I was like, it was just always what if that kind of held me back because in high school I was asked to become like a, teach little kids how to swim. One of my old swim coaches who knew I was deaf, who had taught me to swim, had reached out and asked for me to do this and I had declined her because I was too afraid and like that's one of the opportunities I really wish I would have taken up because then I would have discovered my passion for working with people a lot sooner and it would have been a good opportunity for me to learn how to advocate for myself and work in a different environment that I'm not accustomed to so I just like that's one thing I personally would do differently is not let my fear of things having to work a little bit differently hold me back. Like I would encourage your kids, or if they want to try something new, just let them know that it will work out one way or another. Like you will be able to, as I think it was Angie who said her boss said they would fill any gaps when they needed to. Okay, I'll go. Um, I guess my uh, one thing I change differently is uh, the focus on mental health a little bit. Uh, part of the I had my facial microsomia was I was in and out of the hospital for most of the first 18 years of my life. Uh, we lost track of surgery count, but it's somewhere 25 plus, and especially near the end of elementary years and into middle school, there was a lot of months or parts of the school year that I'd be gone at home for a couple months at a time. And with that, uh, it prevented me from uh, seeing a lot of my friends and classmates. And that part was really hard. And so my advice to parents is to uh, work hard to make sure to give your kids uh, the opportunity to be with friends and that helps, it helped me a lot as I got into high school and sports to uh, have that other activities as uh, some way to make life more normal. Well, I'm actually not going to pass, but I'm gonna wait till the next question because mine works for both, so. Thank you. The next question is from maybe like implants was the best thing that ever happened to me mostly because I've always been curious about sounds you know with all my reading you would read of the different sounds that were made by different things but I really never experienced many of the sounds and so having cochlear implants really kind of made my world even more wide open and uh, just I can listening to the birds and learning to identify birds from their sounds and such finding out that I can sit in my living room and hear the birds outside and even identify them that way, you know, nothing, nothing, uh, it's just so neat to hear chickadees, you know, collaring, dee dee, and you're sitting in your recliner. I mean, what could be better than that to hear? <laughs> so, and then my parents' thing was they always wanted to make sure that we could hear rattlesnakes because we always lived where there were rattlesnakes. Well, I did not hear a rattlesnake until two summers ago, and my husband and I happened on my crossing the road, so I told him, stop, I need to see if I can hear this rattlesnake. So we did stop and, you know, kick some dirt at the rattlesnake, because of course it spoiled right away, and no, it didn't do anything. So I told my husband, well, do it again. And he kicked again, nothing happened, he was so feeble about it. So I said, get out of the way, let me do it. He's like, ah! But like, I stepped closer and then really flicked some sand in the uh, snake's face. And it rattled. And I was like, I never knew it was so loud. Why I could not hear this with hearing aids, I don't know. But it was just like, 
oh, now I know I will hear a rattlesnake out there. So, we just had to do that one. I've never heard a rattlesnake either. So, no, I'm good. I don't want to be that close. <laughs> um, my favorite thing has to be FaceTime. I love FaceTime. Um, I make nothing on the phone, but with FaceTime, you know, I just have to like, see people because I really like this one thing. And so I really like FaceTime. Um, I also really like my uh, earthquake alarm clock at that college. And as my roommates call it, they hate it. They also wake up at 5 a.m. in the morning because I have uh, my alarm clock is connected to my uh, fire alarm Wait, and my phone, and so it put it under the mattress and it's time for you to wake up and then you can take it to bed because that vibration is still making it down my I just want to say I'm on the same page as Joe with about the cochlear implant. It's really amplified hearing, hearing the little things, especially like music in the stores. Like they did that and they didn't really pay attention to that. So um, since I got it recent, like I say recently, about two years ago, if people have questions about that, I'm more than happy to answer them. Um, I also like the alarm clock. I have a similar thing and I hate the feeling of it. I hate it. So. It gets me out of bed. I wake up before the alarm clock and shut it off. So it gets me out of bed. Um, I also really love closed captioning. I don't know what I do without it, um, especially for movies. Um, movie theaters, I do just fine because the, the sound's pretty loud and it's pretty good. But um, I, mean, I think it's really helpful for everybody to hear the words and have the words there because I've met so many people who are like, I love closed captioning. They're not even hard of hearing. Like, it's, it's, it's something everybody should really use, so I guess it can be annoying for some people, right? You don't like them? Yeah. But it's really helpful. Uh, for me, I guess it would be the Baja, and it also includes the part, so a big part of mine was just making sure I was singing on the right side of the classroom and things like that. My suggestion on this is to keep it simple to whatever works for your kid and to not overcomplicate it. So that's me. I already said my favorite thing, which is like FaceTime, and then I also have the same alarm clock. That <laughs> scares me to death. Uh, I want to interject. <laughs> I think her new favorite thing is Bluetooth from uh, anything to her new, her implants because she's always Bluetoothing or I don't know how would you say streaming and we'll talk to her and she's ignoring us I'm like what is going on oh I'm I'm listening to music via Bluetooth so that she really likes. <laughs> there is there is so much technology and I frequently hear that those of us that are hearing loss will have better ways to access technology. And um, a lot of people with typical hearing origination. I actually have the little travel alarm clock that's about this big. It pops it pops in my pillow, and it, it, I have taken it all over the world, and it does its job and it's beautiful. So if you want something that's yeah, not so intrusive, I recommend that. So we're going to um, open this up for questions. We'll skip over the last one so that we can see if anybody has anything. This is your opportunity. If there's something you're just wondering about, you don't need to be embarrassed. Go ahead and ask us. Um, I can promise you, probably with our age, you have you eventually hear just about every question under the sun. I mean, but it's good. It's okay. So you do your microphone. So for you as children, um, what was the best way you heard your parents um, answer questions when people would ask about your hearing aids or why you're wearing um, or whatever technological devices you were using? Like when somebody, like a parent asked you or? So for instance, you're at the grocery store or playground and another child, usually children, come up and ask, of what, what's in her ears? How was the best way for you that your parents answered that question? Good, good question. 
Well, as an older person, I guess, um, my mom would always encourage me when I saw a little kid with hearing aid to say, hey, I like your hearing aid. Look at mine too, you know? And um, I went to, a, I took a trip to Washington recently just to visit my best friend. We went to the aquarium and I saw this little boy with some hearing aids and I was like, I, I wanted to tell him. I should have gone up to him and said, I really like your hearing aid, but he seemed so invested in the fishes. So he's like, I'll leave him alone. But just um, telling them, it's, a, it's just helps me hear is always the greatest thing, just simple truth. I was just gonna say the same thing, like my mom always encouraged me to be the one to explain what it is because you know, it's kind of, I mean, sometimes your child is just too young to explain what it is where they're not around, so it falls on you, but just like Daddy said, sometimes just the simple answer is the best, like this helps me to hear. Because like when I started babysitting in high school, like the girls I would babysit would like come up and feel it and go like, what is this? And I'd be like, well, at the time, you know, I had a hearing aid in this year, so I was like, it's a hearing aid, it just helps me to hear like you. Although, you know, as they took that as an answer, that's what we're doing. Um, so when I was younger, we didn't quite take that approach. My mom uh, helped me come up with different stories on uh, government conspiracies to getting attacked by an alligator on why I was missing a year. My favorite was getting bucked off a ball, stepped on this side of my face. That one I got college roommates to believe for a while, but on a more serious note, uh, I love when people come up and ask me uh, why I'm wearing a hearing aid or why I look like I do. Uh, that's right on that, I was at an engineering camp in high school and I was with a bunch of guys and it took them, I think nearly the end of the week, one of them was finally brave enough to uh, ask me what was different about me. And that entire time leading up to that point, uh, it felt like they knew I was different in some way and because of that, they tried to be polite and ignore it. And it does the opposite to where you feel left out. And so I've learned uh, in your group seconds, just to straight out uh, tell them where I introduce myself because that helps them understand where you're coming from and then like something that they can put to the side so they aren't constantly looking at you trying to figure it out themselves because they're too polite to ask. So my advice, and I've been asked this a lot, is anytime you see that, from my standpoint, I think everyone should be comfortable with going and asking because the more it's talked about, the more accepting it is, in my opinion. So with my hearing loss, it's also connected to my um, physical disability. And with that, I had a one-on-one -on -one aid, mostly to make sure that um, students didn't run into me, or um, if we were in crowds, I wouldn't get bumped around or fall down. Um, so just a simple fall can feel what paralyzed me because of how my spine was always intact. And so um, one thing that um, the school district and my mom asked me if um, I would be okay is within the first week of school, uh, just being in front of the class and explain to them, you know, in little terms uh, why I have a one-on-one -on -one aid, why I have an FM system, what it does and things like that. So um, I, I'm used to doing that quite a bit, in, in, especially in school. And you know, we did something like this where kids would ask questions and all these things. And it was kind of nice because then the kids were also aware, like um, if the teacher was, there was several times, if the teacher walked behind me, students would say, hey, Angie can't see or hear you. So they would say, hey, she can't see you. And then the teacher would go back to Ms. Brown, and you know, it was nice because you had extra support and it wasn't, you know, like awkward or weird. So definitely, you know, I was always okay talking about it, but I know not every child is okay talking about their differences. So um, definitely try to help them be more confident in themselves to be able to advocate for themselves at that younger age. 
is not taboo, so it should be more commonly spoken about. So telling people just that it's hearing aids and it's common is important. So. Yeah, I think it um, changed a lot. I love your story. I also have to add, I think sometimes it has to do with personalities. You clearly have a personality that is comfortable being in a class, in front of a classroom. Um, some kids might not, but this is a good strategy as well as a uh, PowerPoint, just letting the little kids put together a PowerPoint with a few slides. So I know that isn't, that's more than what you asked for, but really good stuff. Um, another question or two before we wrap it up. Yes, from this past. Oh, one more. Can you say a question? Sorry, it kind of goes so fast when we have panels. We could almost get through a whole afternoon with panels, I think. Any last questions? Yeah. Um, I know that in really loud or busy environments, it can be overwhelming and you can't hear very well. My daughter's four and a half, and she really, really gets overwhelmed when it's loud and busy and there are a lot of people and she really retreats. She's really outgoing normally, but in those situations she really retreats. Do you have any like strategies or anything to that I can help teach her to be more comfortable in those environments? Just take your hands off. Do it. <laughs> Just kidding, don't do that. <laughs> it's been helpful though in many situations. Um that's a really good question. You kind of, as I got older, I kind of got used to blocking everything out and I kind of get used to just not hearing everybody and to get used to focusing on the one person and sometimes it helps for you to stay close to them and if you're talking to them, really get close to them and be like, do you need anything? Uh, can you get some bread for me? You know, staying close with them, make sure they don't um, get lost and know that you're there with them. Another thing is like in schools, like you'll have school assemblies and those are always environments that were too loud and very overwhelming for me. So something I had worked out in my MEP was I would be allowed to just like when I was ready to step back and go to just a quiet area for a bit to just kind of decompress. Like that's always an option if she doesn't want to take her hearing aids out. Just because I know like, <laughs> Like it all depends on the kid because like sometimes I'm like yeah let's take them off and other times it's like I feel like I need to have them on because I don't want to miss anything that might be conveyed you know auditorily but having a chance to just kind of step back go to a quiet place and take a deep breath helps too. And of course remember there is a volume control on hearing aids and CIs so they can be turned down too and that can take away some of that echoing part. Uh, I forgot one little piece out here sticking. You want to keep going on that one little piece? Oh, patient? Oh, okay. Um, definitely what everyone has said is definitely, for me, turn it down. Uh, especially when I was younger and had a hearing aid, that I can turn it down. Um, definitely turn, I just turn mine all the way off. And, you know, that's fine. And know the technology of your hearing aid CIs. You know, you can go and use the remote control and just use the microphone on the main speakers at that time. That'll cut down the background noise, too. Yeah, that's a great question. I think you described all of us when you were describing your daughter so you're not alone. Yeah, it's hard. We do have these personalities, but then when it's really noisy, it's just like, oh. So. I have one more. So um, one thing that I would also do is just find one little thing to focus on, whether it was just like a little hand toy or something, because if you're focusing on that one thing, it just so subconsciously is blocking everything else out. Really, yes. This is great. If you have other questions, um, some of us might be around later. There'll be another panel tomorrow, so you can ask questions then. And um, wow, thank you, you guys were awesome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Panels are always awesome. It made me think of a couple quick stories I have to tell you about my kids. Um, they just barely, their new cochlear implant processors with Bluetooth through their phones now instead of another device. 
And so the first day my daughter used it, she went to the store for me and she called to ask me a question. All of a sudden she goes, I think these people think I'm talking to myself. <laughs> she just walked around the store. But anyway, and also there was one time, I mean, I, I liked it when the little, cause little kids would be, mom, what's on their ears and on their head? And I appreciated it when the mom would just come and ask. And you know, one lady's like shuffling away, let's go, let's go. And one other lady, she looks at me and she goes, like she had no idea what they were, but she looks at me and she goes, you just let those two walk around listening to music all day? <laughs> like, no. <laughs> But anyway, so, <laughs> okay, we're going to do, draw two more names, one for a calendar and one for a book. Hunter. And don't forget the barbecue at the park. And, yeah, yep. And Maria. Crossroads Park, which is right across the street. Right the street from the hotel and just up a little bit. It's just right there, and it will be at the far end of the parking lot. So, at the bottom of the hill. The bottom of the hill. <laughs> so, hopefully, um, some of the husbands are over there cooking already. <laughs> we hope. So, but yes, we really appreciate, appreciate all of you coming. And we will see you over, hopefully, at the barbecue, and then again at 8 o'clock in the morning for a lot more information.